So <laughs> Andrew Goethe is our, you can come on up. Andrew Goethe is our next speaker, and she is the manager of digital preservation and repository services at Harvard Library. And uh, in that role, um, she leads the development of Harvard's digital preservation program and oversees the digital repository service, the university's large-scale digital preservation repository. I have to apologize. I, I have a cold today. Um, can you hear me? Can't tell if this is on. I have a cold today, but um, hopefully I won't have a coughing attack in the middle of this. Um, so I'm going to talk about the, the same model that George talked about, the National Digital Stewardship Residency model, but as we're trying to apply it in the Boston area and, and what we've learned from them and how we're trying to adapt it. Um, just a, a roadmap for the, for the rest of our presentations and how it might apply to you. Um, so, so this particular residency is also only um, available to residents, to people who have graduated from a master's program in the last two years. But um, towards the end of this presentation, I'm going to talk about how some of the concepts from, from what we're putting into this model can be applied to people who are just out in, out in the field. And then <clears throat> our next speaker, Kari, is going to talk about um, um, uh, things that that you can do, um, you know, just regardless um, if you've already been out in the field in your careers. So that will be more applicable to people who aren't recently out of school. Um, so I will talk about um, how we how we're replicating the NDSR model in mostly Boston, but I'll say a little bit about how it's being done in New York City. Um, some more detail about what we're doing in Boston and then trying to apply some of these models concepts more generally. So I know this slide should look familiar to you. <laughs> we didn't share slides ahead of time, so I didn't realize it was being um, replicated, but that's okay. This is about replication. Um, so, it, so this model did start by um, IMLS and Library of Congress in the Washington, D.C. area. And um, the, the next step in trying to make this a national model is, OK, it, it, you know, this can work in DC, but does it work in other areas across the country? And so um, New York, um, specifically Metro, it's a, um, a nonprofit um, organization in New York City. They um, were awarded a grant from the IMLS. And Harvard was also awarded a grant from the IMLS to, to replicate this in our areas. And um, we're partnering with MIT libraries as well in the, in the Boston area. And um, so, so New York and Boston applied for, this, for the same exact time period. And we specifically lined up our projects so that the residents have the same exact time frame. Um, so the residents will, will come in, the first set of residents will come into our program this September in both New York and Boston. We'll have the same time span. And the reason we, we're doing this is because not, not only do we need to, to figure out if this will work in other areas, but to become a truly national um, model, we need to be able to work across the US and between these cohorts. Um, so we, we need to figure out, as, as George was saying, how can we collaborate? Um, we need to make sure that we are keeping to the, that the, there is some core NDSR model to this, and that um, we're getting the benefit of having these different cohorts going through the program at the same time. So, so where can we share resources? Where can we trade knowledge? Um, and how can we make it so that even if there's only a small number of residents going through the program in one particular area, they're kind of sharing information um, for virtually between cohorts. So New York and Boston have, have some similarities to DC. Um, so there are a lot of different organizations within these areas that could be potential host institutions in kind of a relatively small geographic area with public transportation. So residents can get around to different events um, within the city and all of these different areas. Um, but there are some differences, too. So um, you, you saw in, in um, DC that there, there were some diverse institutions, but it is a, um, a lot of federal agencies, and it is being um, at, at, um, managed by a federal organization. Um, so in Boston, it's being done mostly with academic institutions, and I'll, and I'll show you who those are. Um, so we're, we're looking at, well, well, how does the model change when it's, when it's um, managed by an academic institution versus a federal agency? And then in New York, it's being done by a nonprofit, Metro, who won't have a 
resident themselves, but they're managing um, the residents at other institutions, which are a lot of um, art, museum type institutions. So, <clears throat> so it will be interesting though to see as, as this model continues and we replicate it in different areas, um, how, how, how the model will change. For example, um, some, some states have, have considered putting together a residency program, but they, their organizations that could be hosts aren't so geographically close. And so there isn't a, a good public transportation system. And so then we, we know we're going to have to rely more on virtual online type um, resources. And we can test, test a little bit of, of that now um, between the cohorts. You know, how, to, how can they communicate with each other? So when we say NDSR and the NDSR model, what exactly does that mean? What, what are we trying to keep the same? And this, this is a very new model, so I think our, our thinking might change over time, but this is, this is what we are thinking now. There, there is a resident cohort model, and what that means is there's a group of, of residents going through the program together. So they're not only learning, there's, there's social learning. And they have this, this network between each other that they can share experiences. And um, what we've, we've found um, from IMLS grants and when they put this together is that, that, that social learning, that group of people going through the program together, there's something very important about that. And that's why this is part of this, this model. The resident eligibility and application requirements, we've kept the same. So, so yes, they, they need to have been um, in a master's program within the last two years. Um, I think we, we broadened it a little bit. We said they could be from, they could have any degree. It doesn't need to be a library science degree. You know, it could be computer science. It could be history. It could be anything as long as they have an interest in having a career in digital preservation or stewardship. We did keep the application requirements the same. We, um, we heard very clearly from the DC folks that that video element, um, having the resident put, put together a video or online project as part of their application was, was very important to them. And we found going through the process, the application process, that it, that it was true. We could, we could see um, how much effort each, each person put into their application by, by what they did. You know, did they, did they put something together specific for this application process to show us their interest in, in um, being part of this residency program, or did they just kind of send us something that they had already prepared? And we saw in some cases that um, people learned software programs as, as part of this, so they told us, yes, we, you know, I had no idea how to put together a video, but I was forced to go learn it. And it, and it kind of showed us that, well, they can learn new software and new technologies, and so that was kind of an added um, way for us to know if, if somebody has, you know, potential to, to learn new things. And, and again, like DC, there is a single institution ad administrating the residency, Harvard Library in this case. We have distributed hosts within, this, within the same metropolitan area, so we have one resident at each host institution. The residency structure we've kept the same, which means that there's, we get all the residents together, there's an immersion workshop to make sure that they all have the, the theoretical foundation to start the program. Then, then they go off and work in their host institutions, and then they come back for some capstone event at the end. And the core curriculum that George mentioned is the same, and, and we think that is important that um, all of these NDSR residency programs need to, have that, need to have a base core curriculum. Something, <coughs> excuse me, some things that we've changed is that we're, we're extending the curriculum. So, that, so they will have that core curriculum the NDSR, NDSR um, curriculum, but um, we think it's very important to, um, to not only bring them together for that immersion um, workshop, which in our case is just a week in the, in the very beginning, but to have learning opportunities extended throughout the residency because it, you know, it takes a while to learn things and there's a lot for people to learn and so we need to spread this out across the residency. We're going to have uh, much more host involvement. We heard from George that this was a particular challenge for them, host engagement. And so from the very beginning, even from the host application process, we've tried to bring the host together and make this more of a peer relationship between the hosts and not um, one host for, and all the rest of the hosts. We did require a preservation specific focus to the projects. So um, each of the pro projects that the residents are working on, it can, ha it can have a, you know, 
a broad range of things. It can, it can involve immediate access, but it has to. What, you know, some component of it has to be preservation. We didn't want people to come out of this program with only putting together some online exhibit and not getting some hands-on experience in preservation. So that was very important to us. And we and we're um, and this part is we're still working on, but we're thinking about, <coughs> excuse me, additional roles beyond the host institutions to, to involve more of the community. Um, so we're we're um, having an instructor instructor workshop to bring. Um, people in to help teach the residents and to get some teaching experience themselves and um, involving people from the community as well. So why did we want to replicate this in Boston? Well, we know we need staff with real world preservation experience. There are um, some educational programs that people can go through now and get theoretical knowledge and they can get some hands on experience, but it's not, it's usually not um, not enough, and, and we want people to have real-world preservation experience so we can be more confident in hiring them. And we recognize that the, this is a really good model. There's, there's mutual benefit for the residents and the hosts. So the residents are, are seeing what it's like to work in, inside one of these organizations on real-world problems. These aren't, these aren't just made-up exercises. These are things that are very important to the host institutions. Um, but the hosts get a lot of benefit out of this as well because the hosts are actually designing these projects. So with, it's, the very, it's different from some of these other fellowship models where um, a student will come in with their own ideas of what they want to do. These are projects that the hosts have designed and they're, they're important to them. Um, so the hosts are, are getting the, the, um, the, real, the benefit of having somebody work on these projects that, they, that they've wanted to have work on. Um, and also what George was, was mentioning about um, that sometimes the higher administration doesn't see the importance of um, roles like this. The, the, your, your institution actually gets to see people in, in these roles that are that very preservation specific. And so I think they get a better idea of the benefit of having people, you know, positions like this within our organization. It makes it much more visible. Um, Harvard and MIT both have an outreach and educational mission, so this aligned really well um, with our mission. <laughs> And there were a lot of local and regional educational opportunities throughout Boston. There's a lot of, you know, historical societies, State Library Museum, JFK Kennedy, there's the library, there's all these different organizations. Um, and we know that there's a lot of learning opportunities, so it seemed like a good fit for us. And we also knew that it would strengthen our institutional relationships between these hosts. You know, we, we probably all of uh, these particular hosts have worked together in, in some capacity before but never as, I think, a, a single group trying to achieve something and learn from each other together. So there's a lot of benefit to us in that. So for both New York City and Boston, this is our timeline for what was funded through the IMLS project, is that we have two sets of residents coming in. So both of them, um, the first one comes in this September. So where we are right now is we've, we have our hosts, we have our residents, and then they'll come in in September. And ours run for nine months until next June. We have a three month period where we can look at it, evaluate it, and, and um, see what, what we thought went well, what didn't, um, and then um, make changes for, for the next set in September. And we knew, we knew that this first Set, the first one had, had to be successful. So um, particularly the, the hosts that we picked. And um, George was talking about a lot of the challenges have to do with um, unexpected things, you know, with hosts um, not, not having quite a, a mentor that they needed or the organization not really understanding the program, not the department's not understanding it. So we didn't take a lot of chances, I think, with this first this first round, we, we knew it had to be successful. Um, so um, we picked, we kind of recruited hosts for this first round because we wanted it to be people that we knew would make it successful, make the program success, successful, and provide great learning opportunities for the residents. And um, we're thinking that the next round, we can maybe take more um, an experimental approach it, it was mentioned, um, how, how can small organizations fit into this? So, so one of the things that we're thinking about as a possible experiment for the second round is that, can we take a group of smaller um, organizations 
put them together, if they have a common um, problem that they're trying to solve or a common project, put one resident with that group and then you know, pick one of them to, to be the mentor and that way a group of organizations can benefit. Another thing that we're thinking about experimenting with is um, going outside our domain of academic institutions, libraries, archives, and museums, and maybe bringing in a commercial organization. Um, so we do have, um, in the Boston area, we have a lot of biomedical industry. Um, we have uh, Google and Microsoft Research. Um, so it's possible that we, we might be able to bring um, one of those in. And if we do, that could go a long way of making this, this model more sustainable. As, you know, if they're willing to pay for their own residence. I'm not going to go through a lot of detail of this, but this, this was our application timeline. Um, first, the, um, we um, selected the hosts, and then we selected the residents. And where we are now is that we, like I said, we, ha we have our hosts, we have our residents, and we're getting ready for um, the next event, which is an instructor workshop in August where we'll be putting out a call for people who, who want to become instructors for the immersion workshop or any time during the residency. You know, if you have a tool you want to demo, if you want to help um, talk about the core curriculum, and there will be um, some training for, the, for that for people who are new instructors. So the host applicants, the things that they needed to do, the, the two main things is they had to express in interest and commitment and then design a good project. Those are basic, the basic two things. And um, like George said, they, do need, they did need to identify a primary mentor. So, so what do we mean by a good project for a resident? Um, this can't be busy work. It can't be digitizing something. It can't be filing things. It can't be any of that kind of just following some operation. There has to be some sort of intellectual challenge to it. Um, the, these residents need to be challenged. And it, it needs to be a project that's tied to the institutional mission. They, they need to have you know, some reason they want the resident to succeed. This is a project that's important to them. Um, and of course, the resident needs to be able to com complete this in nine months. And there has to be something about this project that's resume, resume building for the, for the resident. So even if it's a project that other people are also working on, there has to be some component of that that the resident can say, this was my, this is what I did. And um, you know, to, to be able to show it and be able to um, use that to be able to, to get jobs. So the, the hosts do have a very active role during this um, residency. They can't just sit back and let this happen. They're, they're going to help create a development plan with input from the instructors for the resident at their institution. Of course, they have to mentor the resident. Um, they have to provide at least one site visit for, for the, the rest of the residents and the rest of the hosts. So, uh, you know, a tour, a dep you know, a presentation, something at their activity or at their institution. They're going to have to participate in curriculum activities throughout the residency. And um, actually, I, I'm, I'm glad to hear that our hosts are, are excited about that. They, they do want to be involved and they do want to learn. Um, help identify professional development and training opportunities during the residency. We're going to have a calendar. With the, the, there'll be a calendar of events. Um, so um, that's something that I wanted to mention to you because it'll be useful for the residents, but it'll also be online. So you know, anybody can look at it and say, you know, oh, here's a webinar I didn't realize was coming up. You know, I can I can call into that. Um, so that that'll be something to, to look out for on our website. And then of course help evaluate the program at the end because we do want to keep improving it. These are the hosts that we selected starting in September. So all of them are academic institutions except for WGBH, which, which, which deals with public media. We have Tufts in Somerville. We have Harvard and MIT in Cambridge and Northeastern in Boston, um, and WGBH in Boston. And there is a public transportation system where they, the, the um, students should be able to get around easily to these different um, institutions. And part of um, what we built into the budget was each of them to have a card, a uh, subway pass, so that they could get around pretty easily. These are the, the projects that um, our residents will be working on. So for Harvard Library, something that, that we've needed for a long time is the ability to migrate formats, obsolete formats, to, to more modern formats. And we, we've, that's something that we just haven't had uh, the resources to an extra person to put on. And so this is a great opportunity for us to put a resident 
on developing the process that we're going to go through to develop these migration plans and actually test it out on three world, real world cases because we have we have content in obsolete formats, the Kodak Photo CD, the real audio format, and the Smile playlist. And so this resident is going to have the opportunity to help us out, but also get very valuable experience, I think, in doing something that's, that hasn't been done a lot, which is format migrations. MIT libraries, their, their project is called Making Music Last. So something that I think was a, a learning, um, a kind of a surprise to all of us, is that music is the second most popular minor at MIT. And so in this project, the resident is going to be working on um, helping with an existing team at MIT libraries to develop uh, workflows for managing audio material. At Northeastern, the resident is going to work on a project called Channeling Streams of Archival Records. So they're getting the, these different archival records into their university archives and special collections, and they don't have existing workflows to deal with this. And so this resident is going to come, come in and, and work on three different um, sets of content, recent born digital, legacy born digital, and digitized content. And so they're going to um, develop these workflows for each of these, and then maybe they'll see where there's commonalities between the three workflows. At Tufts University, they're dealing with a lot of research data. And so they're, um, this one, I think, is probably more researchy than the, than the rest of them. But um, here, they're going to be trying to understand um, what is being produced by faculty, by postdocs, by research staff, and um, grad students. And um, so get an understanding of what they're producing, but then create a metadata model for, for, for modeling that research data in the Tufts repository. And then lastly, digital, or, um, WGBH. This resident is going to be working with audiovisual material. And they're going to be um, try, trying to, to help WGBH with, with something that's been a, a real problem for them, is accepting um, audiovisual material from producers. And how do they get that into their repository? So this resident is not only going to work through that process, but then they're, at the end, they're going to put together a webinar in teaching um, materials to teach the rest of their broadcasting um, agencies how, how to do this. So, so I think all, I think you can, say that all five of these are really challenging things that are important to the host institutions. And I know that when, when I've met with, with these hosts, we're all looking forward to learning from each other how we're solving these things, because these are common problems. I mean, Harvard has the same problems with the research data, not understanding it, et cetera. Um, so I did mention that we're, we're thinking of other roles, instructors um, so to help us out with, at, during the immersive week. And then also any time during the residency. And then bringing the community in to help participate in or organize events and, of course, help evaluate the program. This has kind of already been gone through before, but we did ask the, application, the residents to put together kind of a formal application and then the online video, and then rank the hosts, rank their preferences for working within these hosts, which is something that we, we need to revisit because the, the, the whole ranking was something that we, we interpreted one way, the residents interpreted the other way, and, and so we really need to work on that. Um, for example, um, I talked to one of the, the applicants, and I, and I asked her, well, why did you rank the, this, this institution first and this institution second? Because we were having a lot of competition for particular, working at particular institutions. And she said, well, I thought those two were the biggest challenge for me. Um, the others were a better fit. I was like, oh, OK. Well, we didn't think of it that way. We thought you were picking the ones that you thought were the best fit for you. And, and so we really need to rethink this whole um, ranking process. This is, um, so we had 27 um, applicants apply for the residencies. And you can see that the majority were from, from our local area. So from Massachusetts, New York, Pennsylvania, Indiana, and New Jersey, and then some spread throughout the country. We did advertise on uh, so many different uh, graduate lists, but it's, I, I think, you know, we'll have to ask the residents later, but it's probably because of just the, the thought of having to get up, pick up, and move to somewhere else, that it just was more natural for people from Massachusetts to apply. Simmons is the school in um, the library, school, well, they have a library program in Massachusetts, so the majority of our applicants did come from Simmons. We had um, three from NYU, from the, from the MIOP program, and then Indiana University and Rutgers, um, and the rest from various other programs. 
through the United States. It, we did have it open to international students as well, but um, we didn't have any international students apply. And most of them did have um, library and information science degrees. We saw um, three come from the uh, Masters of Arts in MIOP from NYU. And we only had one student come from a completely different um, domain. I think that was history, Master of Arts in History. But other than that, they were all library and information science. These are the five residents we did select. Um, two from Massachusetts, two from New York, and one from Colorado. And so um, we, had, we had actually a really good pool of applicants, and it was very hard to, to, to um, bring it down to just to five. But these were the five we picked. And they will be um, communicating throughout the residency um, through, through our um, website of, of what they're learning. Um, so I hope that you will follow along with them. And this is the residency structure I mentioned earlier. It starts with the immersion workshop. Um, then they go work in the, the host institutions, but participate in ongoing educational and social activities, and then a capstone event. So a little bit about, about the curriculum. So the Immersive Week, we want them to get the full landscape view of digital stewardship, especially if they don't, they don't quite have that background, that understanding of the life cycle of caring for digital material. Um, we are looking to be flexible about how we schedule things. So we're going to have an um, events calendar, but we're going to be looking for things that just pop up because we, we want to take advantage as, as much as we can um, of, of things that just that happen all the time, either within our community or online, and bring those together. We, we don't think that we need to put together everything. There's already a lot of things going on. I'm running out of time, so. Um, <laughs> so during the, during the um, immersion week, we, we are going to bring together instructors. For, the host institutions will participate. Um, but we'll also bring in people from, that weren't host institutions. There are a lot of uh, people that we can bring in to help present. Um, and the residents, they'll also be putting on their own events to discuss the progress of their projects. So what happens during the immersive week? I in the morning, we're going to have the core curriculum focusing on the digital preservation, outreach, and education modules that George mentioned. And this is something that this is kind of the core NDSR that goes through the five, is it five? Yeah, five modules, identify, select, store, protect, manage, and provide. And there is more information about those modules online um, if you just Google for depot. And then um, in the afternoon is, is the hands-on. Um, so we don't want just training. We want them to actually be hands-on learning tools. Um, and since we already know what projects they'll be working on, we're going to be selecting tools um, that we know that they'll be that they'll need for their particular um, projects, and then with discussion and review. And we, we are going to involve the hosts in that immersive week, so they, they will be part of all part of that. There's going to be a number of activities during the residency. Um, the residents will be required to, to attend a, these events. They'll also have to identify one event to organize or lead to build their, their, or, or, um, their event planning skills. And we're going to put together kind of a, a Chinese menu of requirements for their curriculum. So there'll be different categories that they'll need to fill. Um, and these are examples of some of the, that might be some of the categories. Community, so um, having to volunteer to go help with some professional group or library. Skills development, um, identify skills that they need, and then go interview people who they think um, have, have those skills. OK, so, so, so what, you know, if you're not eligible to apply for this residency, what are some of the kind of the core ideas in, in this model that you might be able to apply? Um, so education, we, we assume that. You know, these, these are um, people coming out of master's degree programs. So you have to have that foundation. Um, wh whether it's um, attending a particular workshop or listening to webinars online, but kind of that passive um, learning. But also, we, we think that for these particular careers, you, you have to have some practical, real world, real world experience. So try to seek those, um, volunteering for projects, committees, et cetera, um, learning from people. 
Um, there's an organization called the National Digital Stewardship Alliance, NDSA. Um, that's a, it's, it's a collaboration of organizations all across the United States, and it's free for any organization to join. You just have to be willing to participate in at least one of the working groups, either standards, infrastructure, outreach, uh, what are the others? Innovation. Yes, innovation and must be one that doesn't do anything. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I forget. But anyway, and NDSA. Um, um, but that that is a great um, environment to participate in projects and learn from people because you have all different types of people, you know, people who are just out of school, you have people who have been working in the field for a while, and they are always looking for volunteers for projects. So it's a great, great opportunity to, to get involved and learn. Um, but it's very important to develop your technical skills. And you don't, you don't need a computer science degree for this. You can, there, there's a lot of online learning classes now, the edX's, um, where you can, you can, if you really want to get technical, you can take a computer science program for, for free through, through one of these things. Um, but don't be scared. Um, just, you know, try to download, install tools. Just try to figure it out. You know, just try, try to improve with them. Um, and even consider learning a programming language. Um, it can't hurt. <laughs> or um, something that, that um, we have the need for a lot is, is reading through a technical specification. So, so search for a format um, PDF and download the specification and just try to start reading through it and, and see where, what do I understand, what don't I understand, where do I need to start um, seeking more knowledge. Um, but then not just technical skills, um, just general skills. So some of these things that we're having the resident learn, um, presentation skills, I mean, I don't think anybody likes to present. Um, but over time it gets easier if, if you just make yourself do it and it's an important skill to have. Um, being able to research and write, plan events, that's something that, that you will need to have, this, that kind of skill, um, ability to write a grant, and ability to convene and run meetings. So, the, so these are just general skills that would, would complement your technical skills and what you learn, um, your education. And George mentioned the importance of networking. It is very important to network. Um, so um, participating at conferences, um, especially that the, you know the time in the halls where you're getting coffee that, that time, um, contributing on mailing lists. There's a there's a Google group I think called Digital Curation, um, where um, you know if you start asking questions or maybe you know something and participating back, you can start to get to, to know a network of people. And of course, there's LinkedIn. Um, but then also, um, you know, just reaching out to somebody and saying, "Can I interview you about this? Because I'm interested in this." You know, I think I think people are always willing to to, um, to do that kind of thing. This is our website. The, the URL is on the top, and we are going to be um, putting um, posting project documents. So, so one of the reasons that actually Harvard Library got into this whole residency thing is that the prospect of being able to use the curriculum that comes out of this for um, tra retraining some of our staff who aren't in the digital realm. And I think that's probably, I would sense that's kind of the thing that this group would want. Um, so we will be producing um, some training materials and resources and, and linking to them from this website and having an event calendar that, that um, might be interesting for you to look at. There's a lot of people involved in this. Um, the project manager, um, Nancy, has already been mentioned. She's our curriculum coordinator. We have a great project advisory board. Um, of course, our hosts and mentors, IMLS, Library of Congress, we talk to a lot about this. And then we do talk a lot with the um, New York City and DSR team. Thank you. Any questions? You mentioned programming languages as a skill that we should develop. What particular programming languages do you mean? If you're going to start today, um, I wouldn't learn the languages that I learned. <laughs> 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 um, well, I think minimally, I, I would learn 
um, something that's not really considered a programming language, but HTML and JavaScript. And I would get very familiar with XML. XML is so prevalent in our field. Um, so, so really learn XML. Um, but if you want to get even deeper into programming, then maybe something like Python or PHP, Ruby, yeah. Th those are all being used a lot today. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I, I'm, you had spoken about the immersive week. Um, <clears throat> is there a mechanism in place that will allow people who aren't necessarily uh, directly uh, associated with the, 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 the cohorts um, or the institutions that they are serving in uh, to participate in any of the um, lectures that the, 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 the residents may give, like uh, to follow them, to follow their experiences, or to, to you know, w whereas it's, there's an online space perhaps yeah. where we, we're not able to come physically, right. you know, yeah. to be there. But is there an opportunity for the public yeah. uh, to be engaged in, the, in that? Well, I don't see why there wouldn't be. So we, we did put into the budget um, a WebEx account to be able to, to put on um, presentations like that. And we hadn't really thought about it that much. But um, so, so you talked about two different things. One's the immersion week, and one's the presentations by the residents, which the, they'll probably be making the, the presentations during the residency and not during the immersion, immersion week. But um, I think that we should consider both of those things. Um, Maybe making it so people can just listen in to the immersion week, but then also having the, the residents um, broadcast out. Because I, th I think it's good for them to get that kind of experience too, and of course it would be good to share that information. Okay, so I had a question. Um, you mentioned capstone events um, at the end of the project. Could you give us an example of what a capstone event might be? That's a great question. <laughs> we just have. Right, we, we actually don't know yet what we're going to do for the capstone event, but we think that it's going to be focused more on um, their, their next step for getting a job. So maybe it's working on the, their resume, their next steps. Um, because we know, you know, th they're going to be ready to, to get a job, and we need to be um, helping them with that. So, so I do think it's going to be focused on um, helping them to get a, a job. Um, but then, you know, there'll be some, some of the ceremony as, as well, you know. Uh, we heard from the DC group that they wanted T-shirts, <laughs> 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 you know, that kind of thing. Um, certificates, that, that, that kind of thing. But, um, um, I think Nancy's been talking about making it a community event, so making it something that's that's public and we can invite the community to as well. We, Andrea is right on target because um, we had seventy five attend, and we had it in one of the um, more historic rooms in the Jefferson Building, so it had a good air of formality to it. Um, we had Christine Borgman speak and um, Allison Druin. Um, we wanted others. We had the guy, you may know his name, that heads up the Sesame Workshop. Um, he was going to speak, but see, we waited too long into it, and that's what I said earlier about planning. But yeah, it really should be, Andrea's right on target, it should be about career development, but it should have some pomp and circumstance <laughs> with it because they really like that, and we had a nice reception following, so... We didn't give t-shirts, however. If you have additional questions, you can send them to this email address and, and we'll follow up. <laughs>